Before we begin tonight, I want to take a minute to plug Craig Beam's Between Light and Shadow Twilight Zone podcast, which has been nominated for another Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Award, three or four years running. Uh, it's a great podcast. I encourage you to give it a listen. Craig has been on my show a couple of times, and I hope to get him for the fifth and final season at some point. Go to my life in the shadow of the twilight zone dot blogspot dot com. That's all one word. Uh, to hear all the episodes, that's my life in the shadow of the twilight zone dot blogspot dot com. To hear all the latest episodes, he, it's a great show. I encourage everyone, Nicole, watch it or yes. listen to it rather. He go. It's very produced. It's not like this show that we do here. <laughs> this awesome show. This awesome show. No, it's even better than this awesome show. And Craig is a he's a great guy. Good. I have a hard time to believe it. <laughs> Thank you. You're sweet. <laughs> sweet kid. Um, but anyway, uh, go ahead and listen to that. Uh, okay. What the hell are we talking about tonight? For this one, what what are we doing here? What are we doing, Robert Duvall? Duvall, uh, Robert Duvall, who was in um, Apocalypse Now, right? <laughs> Everything. He loves the smell of napalm in the morning. And I, I, I actually, I want to say, uh, my favorite movie of his uh, yeah. was a more recent movie, actually, than all of the wonderful work he did in the past. He he directed and wrote The Apostle, and it's such it's such a fantastic movie. It's yeah. one of the best movies I've ever seen. He is in it, um, and he plays a kind of a, a lapsed uh, Christian minister who kind of has yeah. to leave town after he finds out he finds out that his wife, played by Farrah Fawcett, has been screwing around with him. And he just he grabs a baseball bat and smacks this guy in the head, puts him in the hospital, and then he just takes off. And he, it's a kind of like a one man's journey to to reclaim his soul after what he did. So he, yeah. he goes to another town. He sets up a new church. He gets to know the people. You know, it's it's just uh, it's just a fantastic movie. But Robert Duvall is just such an incredible oh. actor. I mean, like the Godfather. He was he was uh, the consigliere in the Godfather movies. He was he was in Apocalypse Now. Like I said, this movie Colors, directed by Dennis Hopper, and also starring Sean Penn. Great films. And he was in a Outer Limits episode, a two-parter of an Outer Limits episode called The Inheritors, with uh, with a couple of other people who've been in Twilight Zone as well. Really great episode. But this this is this is a this one. It starts off as a kind of um, a weird fetishistic nightmare that then becomes a Twilight Zone episode. Yes, probably toward the end. Because it's one of these yeah. episodes that has that twist that everybody likes to talk about that happens in Twilight Zone movies or mm -hmm. uh, uh, television shows. So what? Uh, fill us in a little bit on, on Charlie Parks, the character that he plays. Yeah, so he's sort of like it opens up in like an office where everybody's kind of, you know, working at their little desk. And it's, I guess, lunchtime. Everybody gets up to, like, leave, but he stays at his desk and just immediately has a hard time interacting with his office mates. Right. And you kind of think, like, oh, what's going on here? Um, so he's just, like, an odd duck. Yeah, they don't seem to um, like him or... or I, I no, feel, like, yeah, or they're just, like, bullying like him. him. So, yes, and then they show his boss kind of look in and see this and kind of, you know, like, shake his head at him right like so yeah he's just a just an odd fellow from he's, the beginning yeah, and has a hard time interacting right he's a misfit i mean like he just doesn't fit in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he, right well right. i mean that's like he, the thing about it is you instantly believe him in this role mm -hmm. he really kind of looks like that yes he has this weird kind of vacant stare yeah, he has a very he uh, Duval has a very masculine face too. I mean, he just he just looks like yeah. a, he looks like a he's a very masculine sort, but he's timid and awkward, and he has he has a an um, um, a strange posture and yes. unusual comportment about him. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, like he's just like kind of shifty eyed, and he gives you very... all the information just mm -hmm. looking at him. Just look at his face; mm -hmm. you can tell he's awkward. Yeah, and the way he's dressed. Even. Yeah, and he's lonely. I mean, you can just sort of pick up on that right away. Right, right. Well, even like when he goes, like not to jump ahead, but just like as a character piece, like when he goes into the museum, um, he just seems sort of meek. 
And then he kind of gets swept up in this like group of like, <clears throat> like women mm-hmm. who are there to like see the museum. They're getting like a tour and like he can't even like fight past them. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so he just kind of gets carried away by these women, which I thought was, you know, also very telling because that's we've come to find out the same thing in his personal life. Yes. Now he's, he goes to the uh I get what is he on his lunch break or is this after work? I forget. I think it's lunch break because that's why he's late coming right. back. Mm-hmm. He goes in, he goes, he sees this uh, dollhouse. So it's a, it, it is a dollhouse. It's a big mm-hmm. one. It's kind of like a Victorian thing going on here. Mm-hmm. And he's looking inside and I don't know why he becomes, he, he seems already fixated on this doll that's there. This, this uh, female doll, it's a woman. He already seems fixated on it before weird stuff starts to happen. He feels like the, and, and I don't know if we're looking at reality or if we're looking at it through his eyes. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess like at the beginning, I thought maybe mm, it wasn't real. Like it was just him seeing it. I guess this may sound silly, but how do they manage that? How do they manage what? Uh, in there, in the glass case. Oh, <laughs> well, I couldn't say exactly. I know they use magnifying glasses, little tiny tools, single hair brushes, things like that. But mostly they keep at the job until they get things right. But how do they get the girl to move? Uh, transistors? How's that? The girl playing the piano. So he's really kind of like, I don't know what, losing his mind or something. I guess, yeah. Uh, like I said before, it seems fetishistic. It's, mm-hmm. You've got like a man who who looks like what? What I mean, he looks like what? He's in his late twenties, early thirties, maybe. I think like thirties, because I think his sister alludes to him being in his thirties. Right. They try to set him up with with women. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And of course, that doesn't go well because it never goes of well. Lucy. No. When you're doing stuff like that now, you got a you got a wacky younger brother or something like that. He gets back from work and then what? He gets fired by his boss. Yeah. Just for yes. showing up late. I mean, it's like. I, I feel like well, it's... yeah, I feel like it. Well, the boss starts out by saying it's because you're late or no, it's he starts out like, you know, do you like working here? You know, what is your deal? You, oh, because he said, um, I'm sure you have a good excuse for being late. And he's like, no, I don't. Mm. And that's just how he is. He doesn't even he can't even lie. Like, no, he's just no. very honest and and transparent then he's like what the boss is like oh that's the first sign of humanity you've ever expressed to to me in four years of working here don't you like us parks oh well i never thought about it sir well think about it now do you like your fellow workers well i suppose so you suppose so Well, I never thought about it, sir. I don't dislike them. So I feel like he starts out sort of just like telling him like, you know what, you don't fit in here. I don't think you're part of a team. An office is a team sport, essentially, and you're not part of it. So I have to let you go. I was going to use the excuse of you being late, but I can't even do that. Like Which you're just weird. I'm thinking in the back of my head, he has a very good case for a lawsuit there. Right? You can't just fire somebody because you don't like them. You have to come up with a reason to do it. And he, yeah. But I guess he could just say, oh, well, he was late for coming back right. from lunch or something. But Right. Well, but even this guy, like, he's so kind. Like, Duval's character is just so sweet. And he's just like, okay, I'm going, you know. But it goes it goes back to what you were saying before. This guy has no um <clears throat> he doesn't have a mean bone in his body and he doesn't no. and he's and he's honest. And I think he's honest because he just doesn't know how to manipulate he doesn't know how to manipulate people. He doesn't right. know how to manipulate the situation. He doesn't he doesn't see the angle, he just sort of goes straight through. Yeah, yeah. It's just very like like and I don't mean this like in a cruel way, but it's just like he's very simple and like his like way of of seeing the world it's like this is how it is and that's it it's not this sort of like complicated like i'm gonna get something out of you way right manipulative yeah um he's just very honest and open childlike yes very much so but yeah Mm -hmm. i yeah he might be these days he might be considered to be on the spectrum yeah, may, possibly. 
Yeah, just kind of in that, I don't know, weird autistic way or something like that. I, you know, the thing is, when I was a kid, we didn't have that classification. We just had these shy people. We had introverts. Hell, mm-hmm. I was introverted. My God, I never talked to anybody. Right. You know, and, right. and right. sometimes I guess people would get worried about that because they need kids. I mean, Regan's shy. You know, she goes yeah. to school. Uh, she has maybe a couple of people that she talks to, but she doesn't have like a whole, you know, cadre of friends or anything. Right, right. And she right. doesn't like public speaking. And, and I, I have to hear from her teachers about, you know, she doesn't get up and volunteer things. She has to be uh, pressed into answering. And I say, she's just shy. Okay. We're right. all, we, you know, right. I, I would rather her be shy than outgoing in a lot of situations. So you tend to right. stay out of trouble. Right, right. And, and, and again, I think that, you know, more and more we're seeing like, you know, this, and I, I think actually the psychiatrist talks about this later yeah. in the show about, yeah. you know, sort of what, what is, there is no normal, like, none of us can say, like, all of us have our thing, you know, whether, um, whether we're more adaptable to maybe, you know, societal norms, or, you know, cultural norms, or whatever, um, workplace norms, or not, that varies, but there's no, like, the idea of normal is very archaic, I feel like, yeah. because we are all so different. Yeah. And the way we think and learn is, all, is, is just so different. I think we're accepting that more now um, and being more open to it where it's like for this poor guy, you know, in the time that he was existing, mm-hmm. you know, it was like you're odd and, and you don't fit in and, and we're going to uh, shun uh, you for it. Yeah, yeah. And Duval just completely nails oh, this. Yes. I mean, it's really seriously one of the better best performances i've seen on the show oh yeah and so kind like so kind like i think that's like well when you get to it like the relationship with him and the security guard yeah yeah because the security guard could have been cruel yeah but he wasn't that's true that's true he keeps okay so he, he he regardless of him losing his job he keeps going back to the museum and he keeps looking at this this girl in this dollhouse and this girl just seems so real to him and mm-hmm. there seems to be a story going on inside the dollhouse. Yes. Where I there's this 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 other doll that's a male doll that's really kind of nasty to this to this female doll. And mm-hmm. he's seeing all this unfold in his eyes and you just have to wonder if he's lost his mind, if this is real, but of course this is the twilight zone, so. Once we get to that final twist at the end, I mean it's just sort of like it's shown I guess he that he um he he tries to rescue the doll from her uh, boyfriend, fiance, or husband, whatever he is, I'm not really sure. Right, right. So he smashes the the the, the glass case that's protecting the dollhouse, or something like that. So they, right. they put him, they decide to put him in a, in a psychiatric hospital. Yes. Because he thinks that these dolls are alive. Yeah, and like progressively, like at the more he goes, like he's starting to like narrate sort of the interactions, you know, his daily interactions, but also kind of narrating like what he's seeing in the life of the house a little bit too, right. I feel like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should mention that this episode was written by Charles Beaumont. Charles Beaumont uh, was one of the great writers. He was one of the, he was the second most prolific writer on the show behind Rod Serling. Mm-hmm. And he wrote some of the cl- really classic episodes that, that a lot of people remember. Charles Beaumont at the time was suffering from a condition which led to his eventual uh, death. He died at a very young age. A- around this time he began to suffer from uh, a brain disease and a lot of people oh. attributed it to either a combination of Alzheimer's and uh Pick's disease. And, and he wound up uh, dying at the age of uh, 38 years old. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, so a bunch of other writers that were friends of him helped him ghostwrite a couple of these episodes later on in his career. Okay. I, I wanted to bring up another, there's a really disturbing short story that Peter Straub wrote, Peter Straub, the horror novelist, about this mm-hmm. guy who had a fetish for, for, for drinking from baby bottles. And he collected oh. baby bottles, and he had such a weird, like I said, fet- fetishistic uh, desire to drink from them. For some huh. reason, it was really kind of, but it, it was more attributed to, I guess, his stunted growth and his relationship with his mother or something like that. Because okay, I guess his mother didn't give him baby bottles, or I don't know what it was exactly. Yeah. But I, I'm rem- <laughs> reminded reverted. of that, uh, and, and I'm re- reminded of this character. Mm-hmm. because of that and it's, it's 
he um, because he 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 takes he he attaches a personality I, to the dolls, or he's inventing the story because nobody else sees these dolls being alive. Nobody else sees them no. engaged in any kind of relationship with each other. He's seeing it, and he spends a, this time in the in the psychiatric institute, and he's being helped by the psychiatrist, uh, played by William Wyndham. And the psychiatrist, I, 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 it seems like he's he gets rehabilitated. Yeah, but it does. I, you know, I, I suppose a lot of people like to pretend that they've been healed or cured in some way, because right. he still has he still has this um, this this urge to communicate with the dolls. Well, and again, like I think that you know that that's what I think what was so fascinating about Duval's performance is that all of his character choices really led up to that, like him yesing everybody mm. him letting himself be you know babied by his mother tucked into bed um yes that, you know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah like god that was so bizarre could you know this like be, where he's like uh, well could it be freudian in a way i mean like if the mother doesn't want to let the son go and she does baby him that he's just going to wind up like that for the rest of his life this kind of man child right and you know like and his even sister his sister his sister it. is the same too the brother-in-law, yeah. his his sister's husband, isn't really having any any of this and thinks he's weird. Yeah, like I think they want to like help him, but again, like he like he is just one of those people. He's like too kind, so he always says like, "Okay, yes, yes." Like he has terrible boundaries. Yeah, and so everybody takes advantage of that, especially like his his mother, um, and he, so he just kind of gets pushed around. And I think that's kind of like with the um, the psychiatrist too. Like he was like. He's a smart guy. It's not like he was an idiot. Mm. So he's like, "Oh, well, what do I need to do in order to see well, to you, get out of here?" Do you think that you he's know? do you think that he is a a dependent personality? Yeah, like I think he depends on others for everything, like how he should feel, how he shouldn't feel, if he should say something. He's just too agreeable. Right. Okay. So he's 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 amenable. He's mm -hmm. um he's uh manipulable. Yeah, yeah, very malleable, yeah. Now, they set him up with this girl. They <laughs> go on a date or something. Oh, my God, yeah. And the date, it's a really it's a really uh, awkward scene. Yes. To see this girl. This girl's trying to chat him up. She's trying to be interested in him. <laughs> it's just, yeah. He's not. He's not interested. No, not at all. Boy, you sure are quiet. <laughs> that means you're the dangerous type. <laughs> you can't trust the quiet ones. You can trust me. Who says I want to? Well, I only meant to... You know, you want to... Relax. Lean back. Take it easy. There. Isn't that nicer? Yes. Charlie. Hmm? Do you like me? Very much. Then why don't you show it? Well, how do you mean? Well, you might... You might try kissing me first. Well, we hardly even know each other. We just met this evening. We'll try anyway. So it's it's very weird. He goes, he goes, um... He goes home. Uh, and then he leaves again. He goes back to the museum. Yeah. They tried to bring in the psychiatrist to talk him down, and he's uh, he's talking to this doll about his life. Yeah, and the, the, you know, I mean, the funny thing about the doll is she doesn't really say anything, does she? No, she never like answers him. She just or looks even at him seems and... to acknowledge him. I don't even remember her acknowledging him. I could swear she does look up at him and a smile on occasion. I, I from time to time, I think she just sort of she's like playing a part. You know, it's like. Yeah. It's like the dollhouse is a television or something, and she's just playing. Yeah. Her. Yeah, it's almost like she, I feel like as we get closer to the end, she, she starts kind of like looking around, like she's becoming more aware of him. But I think it, for most of it, she, she doesn't, she's just living her little. It seems like she's sitting there knitting the or house. something, right? Well, yeah, at some point she's like, I don't know if she's doing like a tapestry She's like sewing on some kind of a loom mm -hmm. or, you know, like a stretch thing for a tapestry. 
And then, she, yeah, so she's like, you know, a, a wealthy, you know. Oh, it's a nice house. She's very well dressed. This is woman. obviously. Yeah. They've got a housekeeper, too. <laughs> yes, the little housekeeper. And everything's well, then, very, um, is you know, this, and okay, the, the, now, now I got a question here. Is this. Yeah. Is this uh, Duvall's character's uh, uh, yearning for a simpler time? Is this something like. The, he's looking at a dollhouse and he's looking at what is essentially a controlled world. You said that there were three figures in the display case. A young girl, her maid, and a man. That's right. Now let's look at it logically for just a moment. According to the museum officials, there was only one figure, the girl. Where did the others come from? Well, the maid always came from the kitchen or the dining room. And that, that fellow... Yes. Where did he come from? Outside. Outside the case? No, outside the house. Mr. Parks, think about it. There was nothing outside that house but glass. And beyond that, other displays. Isn't that true? Yes. But he came in the front door. I'm mm -hmm. reminded a little bit of The Sims, because I play The Sims. Um, oh, okay. And I, 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 you know, in The Sims, you build a house... You create mm -hmm. characters, you put those characters in the house. They all have relationships with each other. And you're God. Right. You're basically the God yeah. of these people's lives. Right. So, I mean, and that's part of sort of like the, the, the whole idea of the little girl with the dollhouse has that too. Right. Creates these characters, right. put them in, and, and yeah. sort of have them live out adventures as you're controlling them. Is, this, is he looking at this dollhouse like it is his perfect world? I think so. Like, here's this, yeah, here's this, like, beautiful woman. She can, he loves her. He can make her happy. You know, yeah, I think, I think. Oh, and also, it, more it, importantly, it, she can make him happy. Yes. As well. I mean, it's just. Yes, and she will love him back and be understanding of him and who he is and just accept him the way he is in his mind, I think. So this is what he wants. He wants actually, in the end, to escape. He wants to mm -hmm. live inside that world. Yes, and I think the psychiatrist kind of talks about that, like where right. he's like created this hallucination for himself, as the um, psychiatrist is talking about it. That that he's created the world, the ideal world that he would like to be a part of. Right. I'm gonna take this. I want to take this time to talk a little bit about Brandon Cruz's podcast, submitted for mm. your approval. He's back with new episodes. Actually, started at the beginning of the year. And he's working, he's, he's, he's been on my show a couple of times, and again, mm -hmm. I hope to get him for the fifth and final season. He's hip deep in season three for this go-around, which started at the beginning of the year. Go to www.apatheticenthusiasm.com for all the latest episodes. Uh, that's apatheticenthusiasm.com. I, 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 I often quiz him about the nature of that, what the hell that <laughs> website means. <laughs> Two words that don't belong together, apathetic and enthusiasm. Exactly. Right. <laughs> but he also does a killer Rick and Morty podcast. You got to listen to that too. Go there and uh, listen to him ramble on with a guest each week on the, or every couple of weeks that he does the show. Uh, and always support the troops. He's a member of our armed services. <laughs> okay, so nice. uh, back to we get to the twist of this episode, mm -hmm. which is that uh, after he leaves, he goes back to the museum, breaks in. Everybody's looking for him because they know he's there, which right. shows you how how wonderful modern psychiatry is. Um, That's right. Uh, they go there. They can't find him. And, of course, because he sounded crazy with the whole doll thing, nobody even takes a minute to look at the dollhouse except for the security guard. Right. And he swear, he's looking in there, and he sees uh, Charlie there mm -hmm. as, a, uh, as a doll mm -hmm. with the girl. Yes. And they're both uh, they're both looking at this through this viewfinder viewmaster. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> it's actually a stereoscope, but uh, they call yes. it a, a viewmaster. And they're probably looking at some turn of the turn of the century vintage porn. <laughs> I'm assuming anyway, because <laughs> they both have a smile on their face. That's right. They're <laughs> they're very amused by what they're looking at. So the guard puts it together, and it's like you know he uh, he, he he knows what the hell happened. And he just leaves, and he never tells anybody again. That's the twist. Yep. Apparently, this dollhouse has supernatural powers. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he he gets shrinked down and into the dollhouse, which I think was very satisfying ending for me. Because I, you know, it's just sort of one of those 
terrible, like tragic characters. Like he's living in this time and space, you know, because he even alludes to it when he talks about to the doll about his date. And he's like, you know, she she didn't like me and she was, you know, trying to like she was so forward and trying to right. kiss me, you know, on this first date. I had just met her, but that's the world we live in now. So I think he did. It was like I live in a time where I don't fit in. Right. Yeah. So I'm reminded, do you remember speaking of the nineties, the mm-hmm. uh uh the blind melon video, No Rain. Yes. It's a girl in a bumblebee outfit. And, yes. she, and nobody likes her, and she's running around, and she finally comes across a field of other weirdos dressed up as bumblebees, and she goes and uh, parties with them. It's a great video. Yes. I love I love that video. One of my favorite mm-hmm. music videos ever, and also uh, one of my favorite songs. I really like that song a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, gets, he gets what he wants in the end, which is, I guess, to be left alone and to spend the rest of his uh, existence as, as a doll in a dollhouse. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, which yeah. I love that. The security guard is the one because the security guard sees him here every day. He even like says hello and hears him like talking to the dolls. And so I think like the instead of being like, you know, a bully and mocking him, he just kind of lets him do his thing. And so I think you you see like a genuine happiness in the security guard's face for Charlie. Which I thought was very sweet. It was. It, 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 this, it's, it's, it's um, again, kind of, it, it really, it fits into that hour-long format, the story, because you at least, you, you're, you're, it's a character study. So you're spending your time yeah. getting to know this guy. Mm-hmm. And you kind of, you, you side with him in a way. He's your protagonist, which means that everyone else in his life antagonizes him in some yeah. capacity. So it's, it's, it's very much... It's yeah, I, I like this episode a lot. So it is a very satisfying ending, mm-hmm. and it really yes. does. And oh, again, yeah. Duval, just to, 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 you know, he's good. He's so good. He's like he's like Ugh. he's one of these guys who's like a Gene Hackman yes. or a Michael Caine. He's good in everything, no matter what yes. he does. Like you could get yeah. this guy to play, and he's a character actor too. He might be a movie star. He's a big movie star, but he's also a character actor that you can just have play anybody. Yeah. And it's so fun to see some of these, like, Gene Hackman and Robert Duvall in these super young roles, like, before they were sort of who they became, Before right? they became Mount Rushmore, you know? The, right, this, yes. This big yeah, thing. Like, they all start. yeah, all these actors started on shows like these. I mean, like, yeah, uh, you know, people like, we remember an episode we did a long time ago with Carol Burnett. Before she mm-hmm. became big, we did a Carol mm-hmm. Burnett episode. There was an episode with the very young Robert Duvall. Uh, not, not yeah. Robert Duvall, uh, Robert Redford. No. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, and you another just one of my see them, too. too. Like, when, when like, Robert Duvall or um, Gene Hackman in the episode that we talked about. Um, well, no, that was, uh, where... that was Dennis Hopper. Oh, Dennis Hopper. Sorry. Yeah, Dennis Hopper. Like, seeing, like, they take these very tiny roles right like on a an hour long show and just elevate them to this you're like oh yeah okay that's why you are, were so successful in your career because well, they're yeah, just incredible well you, you know talking just a little bit about actors because i was thinking about this is that actors these days these days actors that are working now mm-hmm. don't get to cut their teeth on on small stuff and do a lot of like trotting the boards, doing stage, mm-hmm. doing television, mm-hmm. doing radio. I mean, right. these people did radio. They had like, you know. They I'll, did everything. I'll, I'll be willing to bet, I'm not looking it up at the moment, but Robert Duvall probably had hundreds of credits before he even did this show, just doing mm-hmm. any little thing. Now, actors don't really get to have that experience because the, me- the media, the medium has shrunk to right. either the size of a television screen mm-hmm. or a movie theater. Right. And they don't they don't really work work up the experience, you know these the 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 Duvalls and the and the Dennis Hoppers and the Robert Redfords and, and, and all these other people they mm-hmm. they can do this stuff in their sleep because it's just, oh it's my like god second nature it's like second nature right for them. right right and just the craft you know they were really able to like hone their craft and their work with the all the experience that they had. And have. And that's right. I was um, talking to um, 
uh, my friend Eve about this. She's also an actress, and she was so she was one of the things that amazed her about the Twilight Zone and shows from that time were how interesting mm-hmm. people looked, how their yes. faces looked so interesting. Oh yeah, you didn't necessarily have to be good looking. You right. looked more like like regular people that you see every day on the street. Now everybody right. nowadays everybody's like looks gorgeous. Everybody's beautiful and everybody right. has perfect teeth. She was talking about that too, about how even back then actors did not have perfect teeth. Yes. You know, and now now, now everybody does. Everybody looks like a beauty model these days. Right. Everybody's right. so good looking. And I think right. a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have these big screen TVs in our living room. I've got like a fifty five inch um you know, high definition television in the living room. Everybody has to look right. beautiful. Right, 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 yeah. right. Because you're seeing every pore on their face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sometimes it doesn't look so good. You got to get good yes. makeup in there to cover that cover that shit up. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like I said, a great episode. We both liked it. Uh, um, yes. And that'll do it for this episode of That Twilight Show About That Zone. Next time, I will be discussing Printer's Devil with Brahma Knox. That's another one of my favorites because it's Burgess Meredith, who is a great, just the great Burgess Meredith, playing yeah. the devil. It's such a great episode. Oh, so good. And uh, after that, I'll be taking a um, hiatus for a couple of months and then coming back to finish up the rest of the season uh, once we're past summer <laughs> because we'll all be burning alive here in New York. I'm pretty sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thanks again, Nicole. Thank you. All right. And have a good night. Say good night. Good night. <laughs>